Good day from San Francisco, California. I'd like to start the talk by thanking the award committee for choosing me for this award. And I wanted to thank the nominators and all the people who put time into the nomination. Uh, I know it's a lot of work. I'd like to thank my collaborators over the years, uh, many of whom will see very outdated photos of themselves throughout this talk. And I'd like to thank the community for being an inspiring and welcoming uh, community over the last quarter of a, dec of a century. It's really uh, wonderful to be acknowledged in this way by people that you respect uh, so highly. When I try to think about why I'm standing here today, two reasons come to mind. One is that I'm not a very young man anymore, but let's skip that for now. The other reason is that I've always been blind uh, to the boundaries between fields. In particular, I did my PhD in AI and came into the database community sort of halfway through. But in all of the thinking about the problems over the years, I've really never seen the boundary between what is an AI problem and what is a database problem. And I think if I did anything interesting uh, in my work, it was because I always brought uh, different perspectives uh, into, the, into the work. So I highly recommend uh, being blind in that way. I highly recommend uh, getting older, and I'll try to deliver um, on some of the benefits of both of these uh, in this talk. So I'll reflect on some of the projects I've been involved in over the years. I'll talk a little bit about the future. I'll talk about career paths, coffee, and happiness. Uh, 1993 was the year that I uh, finished my PhD thesis, and one thing that I share with many people I respect is nobody remembers what your PhD thesis is about. In my case, it's especially ironic, given that the first word in, my, in the title of my thesis was irrelevance, reasoning, and knowledge-based systems. But as if I needed an excuse that nobody would remember my thesis, um, 1993 was also the year that the web came on to the main stage and things got very, very messy uh, in the database world, even more than they were before. So uh, since then, a lot of the attention has turned to the web. So the, the first project that I want to reflect on, the information manifold that happened at the AT&T Bell Labs, uh, was when we started looking at data integration in the context of the web. Now, data integration is a problem that's been known for even a couple of decades before, uh, before that. But what the web did was they, it gave us a step up in the complexity of the problem. So all of a sudden, the number of data sources that we're trying to integrate. So data integration is trying to query multiple data sources without having to worry about the details of each one of them. Uh, so data sources came in the, in the hundreds or even thousands at that point. They started overlapping. They started contradicting each other. They were, they were incomplete. So for example, if I gave you a, a data source about uh, movie reviews, how do you know which movies it covers and which movies it doesn't? And moreover, they tended to appear, uh, new ones tended to appear more frequently and to actually disappear uh, quite a bit. So we needed to develop some sort of framework, some sort of foundation for understanding what is in these data sources in order for us to be able to actually answer queries with, with solid foundations and understand how to combine the information uh, from different sources in a, in a principled way. The mechanism that we use um, was of database views because a database view actually tells you a little bit about what's, uh, what's in a particular data source, even if it's not really a view. But that was also a mixture of ideas from, from views, from description logics, from data log, all came together uh, at that time. Fast forward to 2021, uh, it's interesting to think about how would we represent data sources today, given the kinds of sources and the kinds of queries we want to answer. And I think, and we're already starting to see work on this, some sort of neural representation of what's in a data source is starting to become a really interesting uh, area of research. Fast forward to uh, 2000 uh, at the University of Washington, uh, we were working on the problem of schema matching. Schema matching is you have a table here, a table here, and you're trying to figure out which column in this table corresponds to which column in that table. Again, a problem that was uh, well studied uh, even before. But we were making two observations at, the, at that point. One was that if you're integrating many data sources in a particular domain like real estate, you're repeating a lot of the work, that, uh, a lot of the work from, from task to another task. The other observation was that every time that some human schema matcher gives a match between column A and column B, they're actually giving you some sort of training data. They're giving you some sort of label. 
So given those two observations, why not pose the data into the, the schema matching problem as a machine learning problem? And that was exactly what uh, Anne Haidon's uh, PhD thesis was about, for which he received the ACM Distinguished Dissertation Award the first time uh, as, uh, someone from our community got that award. Um, and that was, uh, that was a, a piece of work that actually led to uh, many other uh, works on combining machine learning and data integration in the, in, the, in the years that came after that. If you attended Wang Chutan's keynote uh, earlier in the week, then you would see that basically the progress in machine learning and, and, and natural language processing causes or brings progress in data integration right, uh, right after. Fast forward to about 2007, there's another step up uh, in the complexity of data integration. And here, this is work that was done at Google on web tables. Um, the number of data sources, now that we're talking about HTML tables, these are tables that are sitting on uh, HTML pages already on the web, okay? And so now we're talking about hundreds of millions of tables, and the, the problem from a semantic point of view is extremely complicated. First of all, there are no semantics. There's no such thing as a schema. There's no, even normal forms are not respected. You have a tuple that might span multiple rows. You might tables, you might have tables that span uh, multiple pages um, and nobody's even giving you a query. There's billions of queries given to a, a search engine every day, but a, a fraction of them uh, can be answered with tables. You don't know which one. So part of it is, is trying to figure out when somebody is asking you uh, a query. Now at the time, Search engines, because they were optimized for documents, were not doing a very good job at answering queries whose, whose response could come uh, from tables. And that's what the uh, web tables project addressed. Now, at the same time, um, even though web tables got a lot uh, more of the, of the academic attention, we were also working on fusion tables, which was a way to enable many more people to create data and put it on the web. So for example, fusion tables, which ran for about uh, 10 years as a project at Google, uh, a, a public facing project, and it became the, the tool of choice for journalists to put data into their news stories. Uh, it became a tool of choice in disaster response when people had to put up data sets very quickly in order to, uh, to save people's lives. Uh, so that was the web tables and fusion tables um, era. Now let's look a little bit into the future here. Uh, my, my friend and mentor, Phil Bernstein, once said that if you work on data integration, you have job security, and he's absolutely right. And the reason is, one of the reasons is that, first of all, we never quite solved the problem. And the second thing is that technology, the world changes under you, and then the, the, uh, the data integration problems change. Um, today, I think an observation about what's happening today with technology is, Technology is facing not just problems that have solutions, but dilemmas that don't have great solutions. A dilemma is something that you, you have to make certain choices, but you're never gonna be uh, completely happy. So for example, if you're trying to remove hate speech uh, from online networks, there is no clear definition of hate speech and what might be hate speech for one person might not be hate speech for another. So you're always trying to make certain very tough choices uh, about what is hate speech and what isn't. Um, now, in order to support these uh, dilemmas, we're going to have to um, we're going to have to use data even more than uh, than before. And furthermore, we're going to need data about how the world works. What is what what sometimes is called common sense um, common sense knowledge. So our, what we need to be able to do is to create data sets or databases that, uh, that encode knowledge about how the, how the world works. And we need systems that can query uh, for, specific, um, uh, for specific queries about from these knowledge bases and from, uh, for example, posts on social media. And what is exciting to me at least um, is that actually AI is giving us the opportunity to build these databases in ways that was unimaginable before. So vision systems and text systems are now actually query processors. They can actually answer certain kinds of queries on, um, on their content. Um, and now we have the opportunity to actually build these multimodal knowledge bases. So for example, uh, a table might be a good way to represent who won the World Barista Championship, and text might tell you where uh, coffee was uh, first discovered, but an image 
can show you things that it's not in text. For example, it shows you that a, a cup is held by people in their hands, that a tulip is something that you don't just grow in your garden, but you can put on a, uh, on a coffee cup. And it actually shows you that people are pretty happy when they're drinking coffee. A video can even give you more details about the specific steps that you need to take in order to uh, create a, a perfect cup of coffee. So putting these together is, uh, is a challenge that I think is, is fascinating, but we're now ready to, uh, to attack it. Let's talk about career paths for a moment. Uh, I started my career at AT&T Bell Labs, which was sort of a, an industrial lab, but an ivory tower version of it. Then I went to a real ivory tower at uh, the University of Washington. And then I spent two, uh, still spending uh, time at two uh, research labs that are uh, much closer to, uh, to the business of the company, Google and Facebook. Um, so people ask me a lot, what, are, what do you recommend in terms of, of career paths? Is it free food? or is it the first day of summer quarter that is, uh, that is irresistible? And my answer is yes, try as many of them as possible because each one of them is gonna give you a different experience and, and it's gonna be a different part of the, of the journey that you go through. One question you wanna ask yourself when it, wherever you are is what is that unfair advantage that a particular uh, workplace is giving you? So for example, at Google, the unfair advantage was the amount of data and the queries that we had, but it was also the reach. It was also the fact that the day that we launched Fusion Tables, we had people from a hundred different countries looking at, uh, at Fusion Tables. At a university, there's no doubt the, the unfair advantage is the wonderful students that, that, uh, that you get to have. And what you're seeing here are the photos of my uh, former PhD students uh, who have now become colleagues and friends. And really PhD students is like a gift that keeps on giving, you look at what, what they do and you're proud for forever. It's also a gift that keeps on asking for letters and support and questions, but that's part of the, uh, part of the pleasure. Um, 10 years ago, um, I, I spent some time writing a book about coffee culture. And I wanted to share some of the lessons from that experience because I think, um, uh, I think it gave me a few observations that are worth sharing. Uh, one is it got me out of my comfort zone. And getting out of your comfort zone is a great way to grow. It's a great way to keep, uh, to keep excited. It's also uncomfortable. Uh, so when I went into coffee, I didn't know anything about coffee. I knew very little about coffee, despite what you might think. Uh, I certainly didn't know anybody in the coffee industry. So all of a sudden I came and I had to meet a whole new, uh, had the pleasure of meeting a whole new set of people. One of the interesting things that I felt very clearly at the time was that the, the project of working on the book gave me a, a different kind of work-life balance that I never experienced before. So when I was working on the book, I came home in the evening and I, I didn't want to work anymore. I wanted to work on the book after, of course, after I spent some time with my, my family. Um, but the, the, the point is that sometimes work-life balance comes from growing a passion outside of work, not by necessarily trying to work less. And that was an observation that, would, uh, that I found valuable. The other thing about, um, you know, so, so the other thing about uh, uh, being a database person is that anywhere you go, uh, even when I spent time with, you know, coffee farmers in El Salvador and the, the most exacting uh, coffee roasters in, in Oslo, Norway, anywhere you go, you will find data management problems uh, because everybody has data, whether they know it, uh, whether they know it or not. Let's talk about happiness very quickly. So actually I've spent a few years thinking about happiness. In fact, at Megagon Labs, uh, the, the place I worked before came, coming to Facebook, our, our Starship, uh, our flagship project was how to take the learnings of the science of happiness and try to use AI in order to uh, make it reach many more people on a daily and personalized uh, uh, basis. Obviously, that's still the vision, and, and there's a lot of work to get there. Um, and there's a lot been said about happiness, but I want to make just two observations. One is, um, a lot of happiness after you get some of the basic needs in life uh, uh, taken care of has, has to do with meaning. Whenever you struggle with the questions about uh, the hard questions of life, ask yourself, what is the meaning of what you're doing and why are you doing it? What is your passion um, uh, in, in, in what you're doing? And be prepared for the fact that the answer will change over years. And there are many ways to make impact, not just at work, not just with your family, and not, and, and not just in, in your community. Happiness is not a destination. Happiness is a journey. But always ask yourself, what is the meaning of what you're doing? The second point I want to make is 
about relationships. The morning that I got the news, the wonderful news about this award, once I managed to get myself out of bed, I walked downstairs and I looked at a, a photo of my, my, my late parents and tears started coming down my face. I let that moment play out because I knew it was important. And I realized that I, I, was, I was crying because I really wanted to share that moment with my parents, but I can't anymore. But then I also comforted myself. I, said, I, I reminded myself that while they were still alive and in particular uh, in the later years of their lives, I did as, as best I could do to go and spend time with them, to go and, and help them and, and, uh, and, and create moments of, um, of togetherness. So my advice to you, my strong advice to you is that if you're lucky enough to still have parents, take those times, go and visit them as frequently as you can. It won't make the loss any easier, but it will make living with the loss um, a, little, a little easier. If you're lucky enough to have children, put, put that Sigma paper aside and go and create those moments with, uh, with your children that you and they will remember forever. Whoever it is that's those special people in your lives, take the time to spend time with them because Relationships are the most challenging, but the most rewarding activities you'll always, you'll ever be involved in. With that, I'd like to take a moment to thank the uh, special people in my life who appear here from left to right in the order that they uh, appeared in my life. My daughter, Karina, my son, Casper, and my awesome girlfriend, Eva. Thank you very much again, and I'll take questions. Thank you.